I think it's so much better to listen to the universe sooner rather than later and to listen to yourself sooner rather than later. Hey everybody, welcome back to Tales from the Journey. I am Stephanie Zamora, your host, and I am very excited because today we have a dear friend of mine, Sarah Hockett. She is the creator of Sorry for Your Boss, as well as Explore Story Studios, which is the production company for this podcast. And she is just, she's just a kindred spirit. We actually met working in a very toxic and burnout focused environment. <laughs> Both of us trying really hard to just get our work done and, and not engage with the rest of the team. But thankfully, another mutual friend got us to start talking. And now I can't imagine living my life and having my business without Sarah being a part of my world. So, Sarah, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Do you want to like Yes. Please yourself? tell everybody a bit about <laughs> yourself. Love me. <laughs> so... I'm so happy that you and I met, um, again, like, just like you said, kindred spirits, multi-passionate individuals who can do all of the things, but not people who necessarily should do all of the things because we were both people who were never really giving ourselves a break. And I think that that's common for a lot of people who are multi-passionate. With that, I'll give myself a little more of an introduction. I'm Sarah Hockett. I am a multi-passionate entrepreneur myself. I am the founder of Sorry for Your Boss, and I am a career clarity and confidence coach there for multi-passionate, super creative, or nerd divergent people, not exclusively, but a lot. With that business, we work with a lot of people who might have a ton of interests and not know how to forge those into one career path that makes sense for them because we've all heard so much of the, you should do this and you should do that. And it's never, you should run three businesses, <laughs> which is the path I took, but that's okay. And we do a lot of unlearning and things like that too. In my other business, I work in audio storytelling where I help people to tell their stories through podcasts, audiobooks, and through voiceover. I think that telling our stories can be such a huge piece in the healing process. So for those of us who have been through toxic or traumatic experiences, I think that that's such an important piece, not just for us to start our healing journey, but sometimes for the other people who are still in the mix of those very similar situations and feeling very alone. So that's me in a nutshell. What questions do you have for me, Seth? <laughs> so many. <laughs> I'm I'm really excited that you're here because the work that you're doing, I mean, everything that you're doing, I love because you're right, like multi-passionate people. We've talked about this before in our personal conversations of like how many instances we've worked with people or we've had people give us, give us the feedback of you have to choose one lane. And that always pissed me off and frustrated me. And I said, oh no, I don't. And I love that you are the same way. And you're also, you make art, is that right? That is right. I also have a third business doing resin art where we do a lot of really creative, fun things with resin. Sometimes we do furniture, sometimes we do wall art, we do like textured beach pieces and just really fun, colorful, vibrant things to bring into our spaces and make them a little happier. I love it. And again, I'm so excited for you to be here because you are a great example of how life sometimes frequently shapes us and shapes us very harshly and exhaustingly into the person that we need to be to really do the work that we're here to do. And so you have this incredible journey. It's amazing. Like I'm just, I am so impressed with how far you've come. I mean, you're an incredible, brilliant human on your own, but after everything that you've been through, it's just, it's such a testament to if you keep showing up, if you keep trying to find your way, like you will end up where you're supposed to be. And so we're going to talk all about your toxic and traumatic work experiences and how that shaped you into the amazing coach and mentor that you are today. But I want to start by going back to before all of that, like who was the Sarah just getting started in the world as an adult setting out to start her career like what were you excited about and what did you think that having a grown-up job would look like well i want to start with i'm gonna date myself but i finished school right as we started a pretty significant economic yeah. downturn so any expectations i had before that were crushed pretty quickly by that even as a kid i always had all of these interests and you know, it's super cute when you're five and see people say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you're like, I want to be a ballerina and a journalist and a news anchor and a painter. And, and they're like, oh, that's adorable. But by the time you're 15, if you say the same thing, people are like, so true. They'll give you this weird look like, what is wrong with you? You can't be all of those things. So first of all, I'm going to tell you that you can. <laughs> yes. 
And I'm going to tell you that because my journey of trying to fit into that box pushed me in all of the directions out of that box over and over and over again, and sometimes in really nasty ways. I think it's so much better to listen to the universe sooner rather than later and to listen to yourself sooner rather than later. So anyway, my journey started with, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> and the older I got, the more panicked that question made me because I still had all of these things in my mind that I wanted to do. And the thought of picking something and doing that for 40, 50 years was horrifying. So when it started to become time to pick a college and figure out what I wanted to do there, to make matters worse, I had someone in my house who said, you're not going to college. Uh. They started telling me that from the time I was little. So I started to believe that for a while, for sure. Luckily, I had other people in my life who said, you, sh you should try to go. Even that was just, it was horrifying. Like I couldn't pick a college. I couldn't pick a major. I picked the thing that I thought would just be the quickest path back out of college first. I went to a business school. My major was real-time reporting, which for people that don't know what that is, <laughs> that is learning to use a stenograph like a court reporter, but to caption live TV. I was in that program for eight weeks and I realized I, <laughs> I was going to say that knowing you, that doesn't <laughs> seem like you at all. No. And again, to make things extra spicy for me, because I had the background of you're not going to college, please get out of my house. I was also working basically full-time hours around a full-time course load. And this was something that took a lot of practice and was really boring for me. It, it just, it didn't work. So from there, I had all of the other majors. Finally, I started my adult life. And again, at the beginning of crazy times in our economy. So I started working in retail because those were jobs that I could get. I am not someone built to work in retail. <laughs> um, either. That was apparent from day one. And yet I did it for many years. I managed people. I did all the things I was supposed to do. I worked all the long hours, always tired. I never saw my husband. It was exhausting. So my expectation, I suppose, <laughs> was that I could do something that would be fun and creative and that I could make enough to live. And for a long time, that was not the reality, any of it. I had no time to myself. I was doing things that absolutely did not light me up. And in fact, drained me of any energy I might've had left at the end of the day. And I I had no energy or free time left to live my life outside of that. It's exhausting. You know, and I, I yeah. hadn't thought about that. I graduated, so I did a three-year bachelor program. You're only a little bit older than me, so I think we probably would have been in the same grade at the same time, but I graduated a year early from high school and then did a three-year bachelor's. So I got into the workforce like two years before the economic crash <laughs> and was actually yeah. trying to start my first business with, I guess it was my second business with my then boyfriend and business partner. And so we experienced that, but I, I can only imagine how difficult it was to be a, just trying to like, well, I just, I, I need to get out of here and I need to make money and, and this will do. And then to be like thrust into an economy that just was falling apart. <laughs> I can't imagine how challenging that was. So props to you for getting through that, but let's talk about, you've had a lot of jobs. You've had a lot of different positions in your career and, and I have too, and I would be curious your thoughts. This can be a separate question about like how that relates to being multi-passionate and to being creative and entrepreneurial, like as a personality type, because I, my first two years out of college, I had five different jobs and I like climbed the ranks and just like bounced around because I, I was always seeking something different and I knew I wanted to work for myself. So I think that there's, there might be a connection there. I'd be curious your thoughts on with multi-passionate people, but I want to start by talking about your journey. Me, and I'm going to let you choose because yeah. you've had so many experiences. And if you want to share all of them, that's great too. But walk us through all the jobs, all the different jobs you had and the way, the different ways that they were toxic. Cause this is really important. I think for people to hear, cause not everyone realizes they have a bad boss or they're in a toxic environment. And I think it helps to hear that from other people. It took, like, you are so strong and resilient cause it took you a while before you hit your <laughs> breaking point, which is impressive. But yeah. Walk us through the timeline of some of those experiences. Yeah. So I'm just going to time chunk. So some of my retail experiences when I was really young, I had some really toxic bosses there. I had, I ended up being a general manager for a company that was an independent retailer for some cell phones. And I managed a bunch of people in a bunch of locations. And I was like in my early twenties. So I was doing all of these things, but also it was a small business. It was owned by a couple. Oh my gosh. They were some of the most toxic people I've ever met. They would do all sorts of crazy stuff. And they were the kind of, 
employers, and I had more than one set of these where they thought they were awesome employers because they would pay terrible wages and take advantage <laughs> of you and treat you like crap. But every once in a while, they do something nice outside of like boss duties. Like I remember one of my bosses, that particular job, telling me this story. And he thought he was telling me a story of what a great boss he was. But he was telling me the story about a employee of theirs from a former business who both the husband and the wife were working. The husband was their employee. The wife was not. And they were basically having so much financial trouble that the guy ended up selling like the wife's wedding ring and things to just be able to live. And my boss thought he was telling this great story about what a great boss he is because he went and got the ring out of pawn. It's like, well, but at the same time, <laughs> your employee wasn't making enough to live with a two income household yep. that he had to pawn his ring. And these are the same people I had like an experience once where my one boss was cleaning at one of our locations. And I came by after she had bagged everything up in trash bags. And she said, Hey, can you go take this to the dumpster? Sure. No problem. Take the back trash bags, take them to the dumpster. A week later, she says, I can't find the credit card machine. You must have thrown it out. And it became a whole thing until like uh, many months later when I left, she wouldn't give me my last paycheck because I, I quote threw out the credit card wow. machine, which turns out they found later. <laughs> but I, I mean, I, that's one of the first times I ever lost my mind on a boss. Like when I didn't get my last paycheck and I was like, how is this my fault? Am I supposed to check the trash right. that you put together? Like, do you, do you want me to dump it out in the store before I take it to the dumpster? Like that's wild. I took a job later where it was my get out of retail job and my my soon to be boss was super excited to hire me, put in my two weeks notice, hired and trained my replacement, showed up for day one of work. And my boss says, cool, do you have your stuff with you? Your your stuff for me to send in a corporate driver's license, all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he goes, okay, great. He, we're walking to the copier and he's showing me around the office and he's like, today I'm gonna find out if I was allowed to hire someone. <laughs> Oh no! Turns out he wasn't. Wow. Um, they let me work there for about three weeks and then I had no job. I got laid off because he wasn't supposed to hire me in the first place. I worked at a job once where I started part-time. I got offered another job after I had been there for a couple months part-time. And after that couple of months, I got a job offer for a full-time job. And I said, hey, I really need to have a full-time job. So I have this job or if there's something you want to do here, I really do love my work here. Like, what do you want to do? And they thought about it and they offered me a full-time job. And I said, okay. It should have been a red flag from day one when they said, in one year, <laughs> we will do an evaluation. That's when you'll become eligible for a few vacation days. <laughs> And we'll do an evaluation to see if you can get a raise. And I want to mention, this was a copywriting job. This was skilled work. And while I was there over the course of the year, I took on a boatload of other responsibilities. Not only did I do the copywriting, I did all the editing, all the final say for everything went through me. I started taking on marketing assignments for other clients of theirs. I started doing photography for other publications of theirs. My boss had a political career. I started writing all of her speeches, all of her stuff for the newspapers, managing city <laughs> projects. And so at the end of one year, first I should, I should mention my father passed mm -hmm. away when I was 11 months in and I did not get vacation time. Jeez. And at one year we sat down and we had an evaluation. They started with, you are so awesome. You can do anything. It's so amazing <laughs> that you've been here. Like we just love having you. It's so amazing. You do all the office manager stuff. You do the marketing, you do the copywriting, you do graphics, you do all of the things, but we're not going to give you a raise. And I was super confused. I was like, why? And the answer made me look, update my resume the next day. She said to me, because it's not our fault that your husband likes to play video Whoa. games. He should be able to support you. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I mean, I'm not sure what my husband likes to do in his free time is relevant to <laughs> my raise or my performance here. Like, first of all, he's carrying all of our insurance. I have no benefits here. You're paying me less than a McDonald's worker right now for skilled work. Any of that has no bearing on my performance. Like, you're not paying me enough and that's that. Like I don't have benefits. I have barely any vacation days. I didn't get paid when I had to go take a few days to go across country to my father's funeral. Like it's not okay. No. These were these were also employers who would think they were great employers, pat themselves on the back because I could barely afford to live while I was there because I wasn't making much. And it was about a 20 minute drive from my house across highway. So one day my car was parked out front and my boss said, Hey, looks, looks like you're driving around on May pops. And I was like, say what? And he said, your tires look like they may pop any second. And I was like, Oh yeah, I know, but I can't afford new ones. So it is Jeez. what it is. So they bought me like two new tires. <laughs> 
so that I could go to work without any interruption in my work. But again, it's one of those things like my husband and I both work full-time jobs. It shouldn't be an issue where I can afford tires for my car. And you're really good at what you do. Like this isn't an instance. I feel like sometimes it's easy for people to make assumptions of like, well, you must not have been that good. Like you must not be as good as you think you are. And and granted, there are people out there that see themselves differently than they actually perform, but like you're really skilled. And I don't know what it is. We have the same thing where it's like, we just, we can do all the things and have a history of doing that when like you said earlier like we should not <laughs> you know like <laughs> exactly it would exactly. actually be okay if we just did like the the one job description i had one job where i absorbed in the first month that i was there i think they I was hired to be a graphic designer, ended up taking on a development role. They fired the copywriter and I took that over. And then they fired the project manager and I took that over. And I asked about a raise and they were like, well, you're not working anymore. And like, well, we gave you like more (laughs) that like we negotiated with you when you were hired. I was like, I am doing four jobs now. (laughs) Like I have actually replaced two whole people. And and yet I kept like, I kept on doing all the things. So I get that. I mean, like from that job, (laughs) this is where it starts to really get worse. So from that job, I left because of the whole <laughs> your husband plays video games. Unbelievable. Which is wild. <laughs> but the next job that I had, this is this is where things really started to like the universe was like, stop, you need to go do something else. Stop. <laughs> I took this job in the hospitality industry. They hired me for one job. A month later they promoted me to their director of marketing. Within <laughs> the first three weeks that I worked with their director of marketing, like I have numbers to back myself up. That's why like it definitely stuff like that makes you take a big hit in your confidence. Like maybe it is right. maybe I'm terrible, but I've always been able to look at numbers and be like, look, it's not, I don't think it's me. <laughs> at least not for some things. Within the first few weeks that I was there, our website traffic increased by like 300% almost. It's like 287% increase in our web traffic. During the first two years that I was there, I was constantly micromanaged. They kept telling me like, oh, maybe we just need to like get you a box. <laughs> and I trained like three people to be my quote boss where they weren't really in charge of me, but it made them feel better because they had that person to talk to and not me. I think fundamentally at this place of business where I worked for six years, the fundamental problem was just a big personality clash between myself and the bosses. So I think that it started there already where it was like, Ooh, we don't really want to talk to you, even though ev- you're doing kicking ass at everything right. you do. We need like a middle person, even if they don't know what they're doing. I three times times train people to be my boss. And like some of those times, like we would get stuck in silly things where it'd be like, you can't send an email until I've approved the fonts. And it's like, I'm using our <laughs> brand fonts. So one, one time I literally just went rogue. I was like, I know this is the thing I'm supposed to send. I, I gave them the chance to prove it and they didn't. And I was like, we're going to miss a lot of money if we don't. So I sent an email out that hadn't been approved. And I definitely got in trouble for that. I don't recommend it, <laughs> you know, like, cause I understand their side too. Cause I've been on the other side where it's like, why would you do that? But at the same time, that same email for over a year was generating income and we made like $150,000 from that one email. Cause that's what happens when you let people like, if you have employees, you need to trust and empower them to do the things that they are experts in within that same position. I then had a review. They gave me a big raise, gave me all the praise. Oh my gosh, everything's been awesome. Blah, blah, blah. And then a few weeks later, <laughs> After the raise, my boss says, Hey, can we, can we meet really quick? Sure. Of course. (laughs) So we jump, we jump into this quick meeting and she says, Hey, as you know, we sold sister company XYZ. Yes, I'm aware. The director of marketing for that company who had only been there a couple months, he was fresh out of college. He's a lovely human being. So not his fault that this happened. He's a lovely human being, but he was inexperienced both in that industry, in that, not just the industry, but in that field as well. They said, well, so-and-so, the man boss, really likes him. So we want him to be your boss. He's going to take your job and you're going to work under him. Cool. <laughs> Super. <laughs> Super. Oh, love it. So for a while, pretty much nothing changed. He came and he make he made about twice as much as what I made while I was still doing everything. Fast forward about a, a, a for a little a few months of that and. I got another job because Rose, yeah. right? of course, why would you stay? <laughs> exactly. So I got another job. I literally had my entire desk packed up at that place. I had everything packed. 
I was ready to just walk out immediately because my time there had been terrible. And I tried to keep calling a meeting and nobody would meet with me. I'm talking like I was ready, ready. Like I had everything out of my desk. I had like my phone packed up back in the box, <laughs> everything. And my office was back by the elevators at that time. And my boss was getting ready to leave. And I said, Hey, can we talk really quick? And I pulled her into my office and I said, look, this is how it's been going. This is unacceptable. I'm not going to work like this. Like, I think it's time for me to explore other opportunities. This just, this is just not working for me. And she panicked. And she was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, don't do that. Oh no. And she was like, can you, can you just let me talk to man boss and we'll see if there's anything we can work out. I understand why you're upset. Blah, blah, blah. I leave for the day. I go to meet some friends for drinks. My phone is ringing off the hook the whole time. They're trying to call me. And so finally I, I text her. I'm like, Hey, I'm off right now. Like, I don't, I don't want to ask right now. Yeah. <laughs> so, which I never had there. The entire time that I worked there, I was working all the hours at burnout levels. Like I was there early in the morning and I was there after everyone at night and I was exhausted. So anyway, the conclusion that we came to with my two bosses after that meeting was, well, you're already helping us with all of this social responsibility things that we've already been doing. You've been helping us with those things for years because, hey, I was taking on everything. Ha <laughs> ha. We're getting ready to start a nonprofit and we think you'd be the perfect person to lead it. It just makes sense. Blah, blah, blah. So I thought that sounded pretty good despite the issues, which I, sh I still have no regrets, but I also should have known that when the problem is a cultural fit, you can't right. use that with a different position. But I did. I, I, I decided to take that and I declined the other job. I took my phone back out of the <laughs> box, put my things back in my desk <laughs> and, you know, pressed on. I started that nonprofit from scratch for them. I mean, I, I'm talking like helped write the bylaws, filed for the nonprofit status, um, helped direct, like get the board together, helped grow it. And I did that for four years. The last year that I was there, honestly, the last year and a half I was there it was terrible. Yeah. It was terrible. I really, I loved my job because I loved the work. I was getting to help people. We were doing great things until we weren't. So the last year that I was there, the only thing that we did was a fundraiser. I kept, I would show up to meetings because at the time I was working remotely, but the office was about 30 minutes from where I lived. So I would come into the office for scheduled meetings and no one would show wow. up. If we did have meetings, they, I would get talked over the entire time or not listened to, to the extent it was very obvious because we'd have the next meeting and we'd have the exact same discussion. At one point we canceled some programming. We voted on it. And a few months later they were like, Hey, what happened with that? And I was like, we stopped doing it. We, we voted to stop doing it. And they were like, no, we didn't. Yes, we it's did. It's amazing that these <laughs> companies stay in business. I know. So fast forward a, a bit further, we get to the fall of that year and they still have their for-profit company as well. And I've been reclassified, but I still work on the same schedules basically as everyone in their for-profit. I used to tell myself, I used to tell everyone I was the stepchild because all my friends were <laughs> there, but I wasn't really a part of what they were doing. I, I was under their insurance, but I'd been reclassified so that I technically worked for the nonprofit. Like my entire salary was a donation from the for-profit to uh. the nonprofit. So we get to the fall and that's usually when we are doing um, interviews or not interviews, uh, annual reviews. So they were doing them a little extra early because my one boss was pregnant. So she went to do them before she was on maternity leave. So she's getting them all done in September. So she gets them all done in, in September. Set mine, not me. No <laughs> review for me. <laughs> and I'm like, man, I really am the stepchild. Yeah. Like, I just, yeah. So then I start asking like, Hey, are we going to schedule that? Because what's going on? Like, am I getting a holiday bonus this year? Which is something I've historically gotten from them in the six years I'd been working there. No communication whatsoever. So we get to like December and I'm like, what's happening? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Talk to the payroll person and she's like, well, you got a bonus. And it was like a fourth of what I'd had in previous years and no one communicated it to me uh, other than the payroll person. And then we get to like January and now everybody's like enjoying their races and I still haven't had a review. I had to fill out like the self review, which I think all of those are a waste of everybody's yeah. time. <laughs> Finally, I, I was like, I, we, after asking and asking and asking, it was, I remember the dates because this is, it just got so wild so fast. It was January 29th and I was like, Hey, I had just talked to my boss personally. I just saw, saw him in the hallway at the office and was like, Hey, we still haven't done that. And he was like, Oh God, we haven't done that. Like, no. <laughs> Do you remember doing that? No. Uh, I sent a text message finally on that day on, on January 29th of that year and said like, Hey, I still haven't had my review. We've reached the point where this really isn't okay. There's been no communication. I know something's up. Can we please just talk about it? And I even was like, I said something along the lines of like, I know this isn't you or something like that. Like, because there had been a general feeling of not being very professional from my 
female boss the entire time I'd known her, but still like we'd never done that before right. to anyone ever. Like I'd been there for that long and I've never seen anyone miss their review and not get a pay raise. So her response was, this is not a good way to start the review process. I will get to it when I Whoa. get to it. Whoa, attitude. Whoa. <laughs> well, it's like, that's, and, and by that point now I'm, now I'm annoyed. Like I just, I just sent a screenshot to a friend of mine who had basically been fired for being a girl a few years prior. And I was like, this is what just happened. And I was like, you know, it's not a great way to start the review process by your employee. I think it's so much better to listen to the universe sooner rather than later and to listen to yourself sooner rather than later. The review, like that's really not okay. The next day they actually got back to me and they said, you know, we're gonna schedule, we're gonna schedule it for the 31st. We're, we're gonna schedule your review. It was not a review. I stepped into that meeting thinking it was gonna be a review. It was not a review. What it was, I sat across the table from my two bosses and they said, they confirmed what I already knew. We've lost our passion for this and it's really just become a point of stress. Cool, I knew that, I knew that. It's become abundantly apparent over this yeah. last year. And then the next sentence, that's the part that surprised me. That the fact that they had lost their passion and were stressed out by it, not surprising. The next sentence was surprising. This is where they said, well, we feel like the organization is plateaued. Yes, of course it has <laughs> because you guys have com completely checked out. You don't want to move forward on any projects. I've given you a thousand options and you don't even want to review them. They said, we think it's plateaued. So what we think, we think the only way to break that plateau and they have it become like a really great organization would be for us to hire you a boss. <laughs> That'll right? fix it. <laughs> Great idea, great idea. I, I didn't even know what to say to that. I said, you know, if you've lost your passion and the only way you're going to get it back is hiring someone else, then that's what you should do. I tried to be supportive of this because again, honestly, I love my work and I wanted to continue doing my work. And at that point, I didn't care what that looked like. Sure, I was like, seriously. But at the same time, I still just really wanted to keep doing yeah. my work. I wanted to get back to doing my work. We hadn't really done our, the work that I loved for the last year while they were checked out. I called a friend of mine who they knew as well. And I was like, can we, can we just talk privately? And he, he, you know, he's, he'd worked in nonprofits for a very long time. He'd always been someone who was wonderful for me to get advice from all along the journeys of all of the things and just all around lovely human being. So I was like walking around in our parking lot because I didn't want anyone else to hear me, <laughs> of course. And I'm talking to him and I'm explaining what happened. And I'm like, look, I just got out of this meeting where I sat with them and they said they've lost their passion and they're stressed out about it. They think that hiring someone new is going to fix it. And if that's going to fix it, sure. But I have concerns that that's not going to fix the problem. And he was like, oh my gosh. And he was like, well, if someone's lost their passion, that's usually a new person isn't even no. going to fix that. But he had a lovely consultant who's like, if they're open to it, I, I know this person who is amazing at consulting with nonprofits and helping them tell the story better and understand the the blockages better and look at things in it from a different perspective and help them move forward in a more meaning, meaningful way. Do you think they'd be open to that? And I was like, I don't know. We're kind of at a weird point right here. I'm not sure what they're going to be open to. And he's like, well, let me just connect you guys. Why don't you talk? So I called her. We had a lovely conversation. She's a lovely human being. I did run it past my bosses and they were like, yeah, let's bring her in. To my surprise, I honestly didn't think that was going to happen. <laughs> so we brought her in and she confirmed a lot of the things that I've been telling them for the last year. Like, whoa, as far as nonprofit numbers, you're spending way too much on this one event. It's stressing your staff. It's doing all things. You should just sort of consider getting rid of this. No, 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 no. And then they told her the same thing of like, we really think we, what we need to do is hire Sarah a boss. Here's our outside perspective now. And she was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that makes any sense for you at all. Like she knows, she knows your brand. She knows your project. She knows everything that you're doing. And she, I don't think you realize how much she is doing. She's doing the job of so many people right now because she's doing your marketing, your donor management, your events, your, all of the things like accounting, everything. She's She's doing graphic design. She's doing like all of it. And she's like, what she needs is a team. She doesn't need a boss. She was the wrong gender to give us ah. advice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that had been an ongoing problem at that place of business the entire time I'd been there. Basically completely ignored her advice, had me put a job posting out for boss. I put that posting out. I had to hire this person. Jeez. I had to train this person. And I, I will like, I, the same people did this to me more than once. And, and the second time I could see a bigger difference in the person themselves 
the first time I was like, this kid's not a bad person. It's just whole, this whole situation sucks. The second time I also didn't like the person. Oh, that's <laughs> rough. Which made it even worse. So I hired him. I trained him for a few weeks. He was working remotely. We flew him in. I worked with him for a few days in office with my bosses. And he literally like, this is one of my favorite parts. He literally took some of the full plans that I had already had that I'd been presenting for a year. Didn't even change the documents. They were documents I owned and presented them. And they were like, awesome ideas. And I was like, gross. you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> Super <laughs> gross, right? And then we, I introduced him to our board. We finally had a board meeting. I'd been asking for one forever. We couldn't have one. We had a board meeting to introduce him to our board. So they had me introduce him to our entire board. Like everything was hunky dory. And as soon as that meeting was over, I went back into an office office where they had like the boss's office were, were both connected to this like mini conference room. I walked into that back little conference room and I didn't realize I was there. Ah. And I overheard one of my bosses talking with new guy about like how they were about to fire wow. me. <laughs> this place. <laughs> So I'm just sitting there like, I think I'm about to get fired. Cause like, I was pretty sure they were talking about me because they were like, yeah, you know, like when someone just isn't, isn't passionate about it anymore. That was my favorite part. When someone isn't passionate about it anymore, you know, you can't have them leading. The, you can't have them be a part of the organization and, you know, new guys like, yeah, I totally understand. You know, and that stuff can mess with your head. <laughs> totally. Totally. And like, you know, like new guy, I, I was like, do I sit here and hey, pretend guys. like I can't hear them or do I? <laughs> so like, I like, I did like a, you know, like a little, <laughs> hi, I'm in here and I can hear you. <laughs> and then silence. And I was like, yep, they're talking about me. So the only new guy comes in and he's like, hey, do you have the passwords for like this account, that account? And I'm like, yeah. And I just proceeded to give him passwords knowing, I don't know when it's coming, but I know it's coming. And then my female boss comes in and she's like, hey, can we talk for a second? And I was like, yeah. My male boss never even bothered to come into the room, couldn't face me. I honestly wasn't even sure I was being fired. She was like, you know, it just seems seems like you're not very happy lately. And I think, I think we need to make sure that you can be happy. And I was like, <laughs> please use your words more precisely. <laughs> what? I don't even know what that means. And she was like, well, we just, so we just don't think you're happy here at you know, XYZ organization. So, you know, we're not going to like let you go broke or anything. By the way, after six years of working there, they gave me three weeks severance and thought they were being super generous. Yeah. I, I, I went to go grab my stuff. My mail boss was there and he, he again, panicked. He didn't think I was going to be in there. It's like, he didn't realize I left my stuff in there um, <laughs> to go grab it. And he, he was just like, Oh, uh, I'm sorry. was all he said. And I was like, it's fine. And left. And after that, that still wasn't my rock bottom. It's like crazy it to me that that wasn't like, keep going though. <laughs> I know this broke my heart in so many pieces because again, I loved the work. I loved the work and I wanted to continue doing that kind of work. So what I did was I reached out to someone else, a competitive uh, company for their for-profit business. And I said, hi, <laughs> CEO of this competitor's company. I have been working for the last six years at this company. And for the last four years of that, I've been doing the following thing. And I think you're set up to do this even better. And did you know that these are the following benefits that it would be for you to do these <laughs> things? I honestly thought I'd never hear from them again. Uh, within a couple of days, I heard from the CEO and he was like, yes. We want to do that. We want to do that with you. Let's do it. Let's talk about what that looks like. Um, why don't you fly out here? We'll meet. We'll talk about all the details. Cool. Great. So I get there and there were red flags from the start there. Also, I get there and they're like, well, we don't want to do that thing right away. But what we would like to do is we don't want you to go anywhere. We want you to be with us. So we want to do this other thing that we just created. It's brand new. And we want to have you lead that thing up while we wait to do the other thing. And as soon as we're ready to do that thing, we'll have you do that thing. Um, okay. Yeah. Right. That, that sounds cool. I show up for my first day of training there and they were like, oh, by the way, um, you should know that there's this guy in your training that was doing your job before you. And I was like, well, I thought this was a brand new job. And they were like, well, so they're like, don't tell him that that's the job that you're doing. Cause that's the job he was doing. Oh my and I was like, okay, weird. So on my lunch break of that first day, I'm like, just sort of sitting in a, in a roundabout spot and they're like, COO or something that wasn't the CEO. It was like a high up person who had been with them from the beginning. It's a big company now. She's like, Hey, are you Sarah? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's me. I, who are you? And she was like, let's talk. And I was like, okay. And 
she pulls me into a room and she's like, Hey, all the stuff that you've just been hired to do CEO person actually asked me to do a while ago. So I've been doing that stuff already and I don't understand why you're here. And I was like, cool. And over the course of the uh, week that I was there, I had several conversations that were like that. I had another person be like, who was leading up the training, grab me at a different lunch on a different day and be like, Hey, I know why you're actually here. And I know that you're not supposed to say anything in the class because so-and-so is here and they were doing the job before you. And she was like, honestly, I think you'd be great. But also CEO, when he gets ideas in his head, he hires people and he should never hire people because the people he hires, he then gets bored with and they don't awesome. stick around. And I was like, well, I'm very sticky. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, no problem. Great to hear. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So fast forward five months and I got laid off from that job. They decided to do mass layoffs. And so they got rid of tons of people all in one day. And I was one of the last myself and one other girl were the last ones that were on the list. I found out by receiving an email said, Hey, we're sending your last paycheck here. And I was like, say what? And during that time is when things got really bad. Um, the period after that, because I couldn't get unemployment because in Florida, unemployment is terrible. But also if you have filed a claim within one year, you can't file a new claim. You can only do the remainder of that claim. So I had like one week left of unemployment at that point and then no income. I sprained my ankle <laughs> that same year, like very badly. And it was my right ankle. So I couldn't uh, mm. drive or anything. <laughs> Sarah needs a I, the day that I The day that I sprained the ankle, I was supposed to go interview with an old friend of mine who was like, oh my gosh, we super missed out on hiring you when we had the chance, but I have something open now. So like, let's meet. He's like, I'm going to be in Florida, which was where he was going to be in Florida was like five hours away. So the original plan, I was supposed to drive out like the five hours, meet him, stay with his mom, who's lovely, and then drive back. Well, I sprained my ankle the next day. <laughs> So my husband took off work. He drove me the five hours. We had to drive back the same day because he had to work the same the next day. But at any rate, I get out there and I'm super excited. He's telling me about the job and he's like, these are the things that I want you to do. And it's like basically be second in command at his large global international company. And then he was like, I was like, cool, what's the pay? And he was like, well, I think it's like 13 or $14 an hour. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh no, yeah. I can't work for that. Not for that kind of position. Like that doesn't, I can't do that. So we drove the five hours back and I was completely disappointed. And I had so much trouble for a little while after that, finding something. I've been someone who never had trouble finding a job, but I literally just reached my breaking yeah. point and I wasn't really trying the way that I had been. I then had a series of like the rejection letters and each one of those got more and more disappointing. And I had an interview. I had a series of interviews with a company where the CEO was actually aforementioned um, friend who gave advice and was a reference on my resume for all of the things. And the decision finally came down to that person. And I thought, got that one. <sighs> Never heard from them again. Totally yeah. does to me. I ended up taking a job that was not at all what I would have wanted. It paid not a lot. So the hours were weird. It was like an hour from my house, a long commute. And a lot of things really didn't match up there. But it, that job allowed me to heal because my boss, while we definitely had some differences in opinion on a lot of things, oh my God, he was such a good boss. Such a good boss. I'd been there like a month and I needed, I had something already scheduled and I was like, Hey, I have this thing scheduled. I was supposed to go like to the other side of the country for a few days. And he was like, no problem. Like it'll, it'll even out. Just take the days. Like we'll pay you for them. It'll, we'll figure it out. Not a big deal. And then for that same vacation, he was like, don't check email. Those are good Don't check bosses. messages. Yeah. I honestly, because I'd spent my entire career always stuck to, like I, you know, be in the church festival at funerals and weddings and stuff, taking the phone calls and for him to be like, don't. And I was like, really? And he was like, yeah, there is absolutely nothing that is going to come through here that can't wait until you're back. And if it's something that absolutely cannot wait until you're back, there are three more of us here and one of us can handle it. I guarantee Seriously. you. Seriously. I, when I, I tell team, when I hire them, like there are times that I am working on the weekends or in evenings, please ignore me. Like that's like, just ignore me. I don't expect you to, if I'm being weird <laughs> exactly. and I'm working on the weekend, like just ignore me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So while that job, the first week at that job, like I was very, very, very miserable like very miserable, like taking that job. It was someone who knew a former employer and pay wise, responsibility wise, all of it felt like stepping back in my career 10 years. While my boss was lovely, the board there was not. Yeah. Um, and the board there treated me like a stupid kid. Like, I'm not like a narcissistic or conceited person, but some of them like, you're giving me advice and I've done far more in my short life than you have in your longer one. Like, <laughs> 
Like your resume consists of one thing that you've been doing for the last how many years. And like, while you are awesome at that one thing, like guarantee you're awesome at that one thing, like other things, maybe you shouldn't be giving advice on. Right. <laughs> um, again, like while there were definitely the, the first bit there was very, very rough for me. I, I had a hard time accepting that. Like, this is my job now. And it hurt in a lot of ways. But at the same time, like I said, that job allowed me the time and the space to heal and to understand what a good boss is and a good team is. Because not only was my boss great, we had a small team there and they were awesome. Always there backing each other up. You know, it's one of those journeys that like you hear about it and you almost question if it's real because it's like just gets worse and worse and worse. And it it's just, again, it's incredible to me that the end of that, it was six years total, right? The one job with the nonprofit. Yeah. That that wasn't your yeah. breaking point. And I want to talk, if you're open to it, a little bit more about your breaking point, because you shared that in the intake questionnaire, that there was like a really dark moment, like a really, yeah. I just don't think I can do this anymore moment. Are you willing to share more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's important for all of us to share those really dark moments, because I think it's like, as I said at the beginning of the story, the whole reason I do the audio stuff is to help people tell those stories and to help us feel connected. During that time, one of the things that kept me grounded during the, the whole of that time, all of it when I was sitting at a desk at the six year job or when I was driving back and forth to the, I feel like I just took a step backwards 10 years. I was listening to audiobooks and I was listening to podcasts and I was listening to other people's stories. I definitely reached a point when I took that, the bad job, not the, the healing right. job. I don't want to say it's a bad <laughs> job. It just felt like such yeah. a step backwards from all the things that I had done. I took that job and within the first few days, I felt so bad that I was literally raiding my medicine cabinet to see what I could take to just end it truly. Yeah. And I found a bottle of tramadol in there. And I thought if I don't feel any better by next week, I have, I, I can't do this. I can't look at my life for the next unknown number of months years, whatever, and feel like this, which again, the irony is that's, that's the job that healed me. The job that felt so bad at first is the job that healed me. But I will also say that a big part of that healing journey was the vacation that I wanted to take when I was there for a month was to go to a conference that I had planned on going to for months. And then I almost didn't, my, luckily my wonderful husband was like, you, you yeah. should go. Like we do not have the money, but put Good it on a credit card. Go. He's great. <laughs> <laughs> so I went, and that was really the biggest jump start to my healing journey because the organizer, the the event was Everything Conference, which is backed by Emily Wapnick, who, if you've never seen her TED Talk and you feel like you have all the passions, she's please, amazing. Check it out. She's amazing. But I have to throw out huge props, not just to her, but also to her event organizer, who I am going to give her a shout out. You know her too, Vanessa yes. Tharp. She created such an amazing event space there. There was no small talk. There was no bullshit. We've all been to conferences where it's like, oh, <sighs> together. nobody wants to have that conversation. This was... It was participant led. I actually led one of the things myself. I did Zen art, which is something I was teaching when I was doing a lot of my resin art still very heavily, where it's a relaxation through art. There were a lot of other ways where we got to learn from each other. But the big thing was no small talk. We could sit with each other and like someone sat down next to me and was like, I caught my husband cheating this year. And I left and now I had to start over with nothing in that That's gives the kind me of environment goosebumps. That she created. That's such a powerful space. <laughs> yeah. And before I knew it, I'd spent the last two years, one year, trying to pretend that everything was okay when it wasn't. While I was job hunting, it was like, I didn't get fired. I just left. <laughs> um, you know, because that's what we do. Like, I'm super yep, duper. Like, you know, I have my social media full of like, totally. I had my social media full of like, I'm at the beach today. It's lovely. <laughs> hashtag blessed. You know, I, I don't do hashtag blessed, but that um, was the spirit you of know it. the tip of... <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. From the outside, you wouldn't have known if you didn't really know. My husband was terribly concerned about me. But, I'm sure. But, but anybody else would have thought like, oh, she's living the life. But in that space, and like I had an, I had a moment where I was talking with someone. We were in, like in little breakout groups from someone else's session. And I don't even remember how the conversation got there. And what I said to this person was, I am so worried that all of the best things I've uh, that I'm going to do in life, I've already done. And there's that I've peaked and I'm never going to do anything that good again. And luckily that person is now a lovely friend of mine and she was so supportive and so lovely. And over the, over the course of the few days that that conference was, I'd now told so many people 
I got fired from my job and this happened and then I got laid off and now I'm in this job that makes me want to cry every night. And when I started telling people the real truth, my my real story, oh my gosh, it was like a weight was lifted. It's so freeing. Yeah. I have goosebumps. That is so powerful. And I know Brene Brown talks a lot about shame and how when we shine light on shame, like it stops having that pull and that power and that heaviness, but it's really hard to do that. It's really hard to be like, I'm not okay. And this happened. And you know, these things (laughs) that we're taught are shameful, even though they're not like people get fired all the time. People get laid off all the time. Like people fail at things all the time. Life happens in so many ways. And we all have something that we're terrified to talk about. And I know for me, like I didn't have any spaces like that. I was lucky that I had friends that we don't small talk, but I remember there was a period where I decided to answer every question. Honestly, like I would go to the grocery store and the cashier would be like, how are you today? Right? Like that's what they're supposed to do. And I'd be like, I'm freaking horrible. I can't pay my bills. And (laughs) you know, this happened and uh, uh, how are you? And, and I'd say like eight out of 10 of them would say something back, like something real. And you could tell that for both of us, even though it didn't make our life any better, there was this like lightness of like, okay, like (laughs) other people are out here struggling too. And this is normal. And I don't have to go through the whole, I'm great. How are you? Because that for me anyways, that killed me a little bit more each time to pretend like I was okay. And in my healing, like I was very vocal. I was writing all the time because I couldn't help it. There were still a lot of places where I couldn't tell the truth when I was going through my bankruptcy when I wasn't making any money. You don't broadcast that when you're running a business, (laughs) you know? And so when I wrote my book, like there was a lot of that that was really powerful and healing and helpful too. But I just think it's so important. And you've said this before to talk about the way most people would tell that story is I had a string of bad jobs and it didn't go well. And, you know, it got really hard and for a little bit and then it turned a corner and it's like, no, it didn't. I want to hear about the time (laughs) that you were rummaging through your medicine cabinet, like, so that I don't feel crazy because I've had those moments too. Exactly. And I think that too many people tell the end of the story, but they don't tell all of the things that the universe shoved in their face over and over and over again to push them to where they are. For me, I think that the major lesson was, hey girl, you need to take a break. Like (laughs) you need to stop working at this pace because this is not healthy. You're always exhausted. It's affecting your health. Just stop, just stop. And I think that that's the message that I was getting over and over again. Stop, take a break, stop, take a break, stop, take a break. And now I listen to that. And weirdly, things have gone so much smoother now that I listen yeah. to that. <laughs> Funny how that works. <laughs> I think, yeah. I think anyone who is multi-passionate and has that like overachiever piece, you know, whatever, whatever trait that comes from, cause I definitely have had that too. It's like, when you realize you don't actually have to work so hard, it's a yeah. little bit of a mind fuck. Like, <laughs> cause you've spent totally, so much of yeah. your life, like busting your butt. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, I can actually prioritize my joy and my self care. I can say no to things. I can have boundaries. I can do less and things can be better. Yeah. Well, the important thing with that is so many of us that have been at that go, 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 go all the time start to tie our value into productivity and we start to feel guilt and shame Absolutely. when we're not producing. Even when it's like, oh, I'm going to take the time for myself and do the <laughs> thing. If we haven't processed all of the junk behind that first, we're not going to actually enjoy it because the whole time you're thinking, well, I should be doing this or I could be doing that. Like, And you're not, you're not really, truly turning off and actually feeling joy when it's always in the back of your head, the things that you should be doing. Totally. And I want to talk a little bit more about your rock bottom because I personally love them. I think I get inappropriately excited by when people are at rock bottom, but that's because I've been through so many and I know what's on the other side of them. Like they, they can destroy us and that can be the end of us. But oftentimes, because for the most part, most humans are very resilient. And if we don't choose, like I've, I've talked before about being suicidal. Um, and that's like a thing that I carry with me. Like if I get depressed, suicidal ideation, that always comes up. And I've made the choice that like, I'm going to stay here and see this life through. And so when you have that mentality of like, it's just not an option, like, some point you have to get back up and go again. Um, But it's not easy. And so I'd love to hear more about the job, how it helped heal you, like finding that community I know was a big part of it, but anything else that really helped you move through this dark period and like start to settle back into yourself. Yeah. So um, one of the big things with the job, like we'll just talk about the healing aspects of that job first. So that the job, my boss was a super supportive boss. And I'd never really had that before. She's just like, go on your own until you're in trouble. And then I'll tell you you're in trouble. <laughs> so my boss would be like, we would start every week, every Monday, we had 
a meeting that would last a full staff because our full staff was four. We would have a full staff meeting every Monday that would last between 15 to 30 minutes max. This meeting, we would go around the table and he was leading the meeting. Sometimes we would just chat and he'd make jokes and stuff (laughs) and be fun beforehand. But then we would go around the table, each one of us, and he would say, what are you working on this week? What do you need from me? How can I support you? Mm. And he would genuinely like follow through on the support. Like, that what? makes my heart happy. I've never had that happen before. <laughs> I know he was so, so lovely. I felt terrible when I left there, but um, it was time to move on for a variety of other reasons. But it was amazing. I didn't spend all of my time wrapped up in meetings. And I was always supported. When I very first started, we had a phone there that rang nonstop all day, every day for all of the things. Um, we had a front desk person and we would all cover off and on as she was at lunch or you know, doing personal things, whatever. But he made it known from day one. Like if you ever have someone on the phone who is yelling at you, who has been completely unreasonable, you just say, hey, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm going to get insert boss name. And he's like, you give them to me <laughs> because that's my job. I'm like Nobody's going to talk to you guys like that. <laughs> For like events and stuff, I did a bunch of events while I was there. That man showed up at every single event and helped with all of the setup and made sure everything was going smoothly. It was never just like, oh, you figure it out, which was what I was used to. And like, we were at one of the last events that I did there and it was a big one. And he was like, okay, how can I help you today? Like, he was like helping me unload stuff and help me set stuff up. And I was like, what is this? (laughs) But it was amazing. And again, like the just being able to turn off was huge. I told him when I got back from that first vacation, I was like, I, I took my laptop and I checked emails on the first day because I felt like anxiety about not. And then I was, and then I was like, and then I heard your voice in my head being like, there is nothing that cannot wait. But I still like, I had anxiety about it. And he was like, don't, don't ever have anxiety about that. I absolutely meant it. There's nothing that cannot wow. wait. Like when you're off, you should be off. Family is important. Free time is important. You should enjoy your life outside of here. Like I understand everybody has a life outside of here because for me, you and I talk about winning strategies a lot, but for me, because of how I was brought up, because of needing to buy my own things from the time I was 14 on, I started working at 14. I worked crazy hours um, around a school schedule. My winning strategy was just work yourself into the ground, work all of the hours, sleep, work more hours. This was the start of breaking that cycle. It was, you don't have to always be on. Uh, That was the first time in my life I'd ever thought, I don't have to always be on. (laughs) Yeah. I've had moments like that where you're like, I've been living in this world this whole time and that's not the only world to live in. (laughs) What? Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, during my time there, like I said, the first day felt like death. Yeah. It felt like I it felt like a slow death. It felt like I'm going to be here. I don't know how long I'm going to be here. Now I have less time to look for other jobs. Again, best place that I could have ended up. But during that time, I was like, oh my gosh, some days I have to get up at like four in the morning to start early events. And that felt terrible. I'm not a morning person. I don't like my schedule to be wildly <laughs> out of whack anyway. Like I don't like to work late at night. I don't like to work. And even though I was doing that for years, like it still just felt terrible. And even though that that job just felt so bad in the first week, like I said, I, I decided like, I'll just wait one more week. And if, if it still feels really bad, I can't, I, I know I can't do this anymore. And during that first week, we had an event <laughs> on the beach in August. <laughs> It was so hot. I thought I was, I still had a sprained ankle. So I'm like in the sand in an ankle brace mm-hmm. taking photos. But my boss who was in the process of um, having a mother who was very unwell was right there beside us. He was out there sweating with us. <laughs> and making sure that things were going well. And so then, like I said, it was, okay, well, maybe I'll just wait one more week. And then it was like, well, well, now I have to wait until after that conference, which was like a month later. And then after that conference, that was a big flip, a, a big switch flipped for me because just being able to stop having all of the masks and put down some of the things that I was carrying as shields, as masks, as yeah. armor, being able to just lighten the load and take some of those things off because now there were people out in the world who I was going to stay connected with who knew what had really happened and that I really was not okay. That was huge. Yeah. That makes such a difference. Like the, the just love and acceptance of people that are like, okay, like you tell them your dark, hard stuff and all the things you've been embarrassed or ashamed yeah. of. And they're just like, cool. Do you want to get lunch? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tell me more Pretty about much, it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And like at that same conference I met, a wonderful human who had worked in ministry all of his life, worked with the church, helped a ton of people. He was gay and he was married to a woman. And when it finally came out, his whole life blew up. And I remember him sharing, I don't even remember what the tattoo was, but he was like, I got this 
to always remind myself, no matter how hard it is, to always be myself. Because even when it's hard, that's still better. And I was like, hey, I have this one. Nevertheless, she persisted, which I got at the time when I was working at the six-year job, which, as I mentioned, was not very female-friendly. I had a couple other people that went with me. And I looked at that every day that after that, that I still worked at that job. Like, okay, we, we're not very woman-friendly here, but I can keep going. I can keep doing this. So having those kind of, kind of connections with people, too, I was like, oh, he got a tattoo to commemorate, yeah. you know, his his own work and life stuff. And I have mine. And he and I hugged after he shared. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have this one for this reason. And, you know, it's making those kind of connections that I think really, really makes a difference. Absolutely. And I want to say one thing about Good Bosses before we transition into how you started doing the amazing work that you're doing and what it is that you do. Yes. And you've met my best boss of all time. I guess you guys maybe only on the phone, but I think yeah. what I want to say about that is like, I went into the workforce are like, preloaded with beliefs about what is and is not okay at work and how bosses should be. And I feel like you had something similar where it's just like, maybe you don't have a lot of life experience and work experience yet, but you know that like, this can't be how you run a business and can't be how you manage people well. And I had that throughout different jobs, especially my first job, because I was 11 years younger, I think, than everyone else there. And there was just a lot I didn't agree with and ways that they treated me that were not okay. And and I would go through all my jobs and I would, I would have similar things where I'm like, I don't think this is okay. Like if I was a boss, this is not what I would do. I would do this other thing instead. And people would always be like, you don't know, you're young, blah, blah, blah. And then I got <laughs> the terrible job at a startup where I ended up having four jobs, but I had the best boss ever, the best marketing manager ever who went to bat for us and who looked out yeah. for us and was like a papa bear. Like at one point they made us all start sharing offices and I came in part time. Like I worked from home part of the time. And when I would come in, I would share an office with him and we would close the door and he would talk to me about my business and where I should move to and what I should do Love instead. It. And can he help with this? Like he was just incredible. He's just the most incredible human ever. Yeah. Like a complete and total embodiment of all the things that I believed, but hadn't seen yet. And so yeah. I think what I want to say, and yeah. I'm sure you have stuff to say about this too too is like, if you're in a bad job and you have a terrible, it's a terrible environment, a terrible boss, like, I don't care if it's like your first six weeks working in the real world, like trust your gut on that because it, yep. I didn't, I didn't experience it until five, six, seven years into my career, maybe. Lucky. You know? Yeah. Very lucky. <laughs> and I wasn't wrong. He was the best boss ever. And everybody felt that way. And I just, yeah, I just think it's, it's it just, yeah, you got to trust yourself on those red flags. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, like on that note, since I was in my early twenties, I always was some form of the boss, whether it was the top, cause I've been there or it was like middle management. The people that work, I always treated my people that way. And my people were always learning, growing, thriving, making like hitting and exceeding their goals, doing awesome things. So it just made sense to me. <laughs> to work with people in that way. And like, even now I still have former employees that will contact me and be like, Hey, this just happened. What do you think? Or, Hey, I just got offered this and this, what should I do? And actually that was part of my journey towards where I'm at now. It's like, look, I got so many people that will show up out of the woodwork that I knew years ago. And they'll be like, help me. What do I do with my mm -hmm. career? And I was like, well, if I'm giving this advice and I love helping with those things, like I should be able, I should, I should help more people with this. Like, because I had to machete hack my way through all of the things, I'd really love it if I could pave that path for someone else and make it a little smoother, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, let's talk about that. So let's talk about how, because you're so good at this and I've seen you do this when we work together with people that were under you. I see you do that as a friend. Like you're just, you're so brilliant for one, but you're also the level of genius that you have around team and hiring and finding your right career path and like negotiating, standing up for yourself, the red flags. You're so good at when, <laughs> when people send you stuff and you're just like, nope, nope, nope. Ask this, do that. Like you're just, you're so good at it. And so I would love if you could share a little bit of the story of how you made the decision to do this and then yeah, talk about what it is that you do. Yeah. So literally one of the things that I ask every single client is like, what, what do people come to you for advice on? And for me, when I ask myself that question is like, for as long as I can remember all of my adult life, people would come to me and ask for advice on career stuff. It's like, do you think I should do this or this? Or do you think I could do this? Or do you think this is possible? Or I just got the following email from my boss. What do I say? All of those things. And, and again, like I was just saying, like sometimes it would be people who I hadn't talked to for years. It'd be former employees who would show up years later and be like, oh my gosh, this just happened. What do I do? So when I started 
after I finally had healed from some of my own things and started climbing back out and I started looking at my winning strategies, but I also started looking at what am I good at? What lights me up? How do I want to show up in this world? Who do I want to help? And when I started looking at all those things, the pattern was so obvious. I was like, I need to help people through their career stuff because I already have been. I've been doing it for years. I've been doing it since I was in my early 20s. Even when it comes to just finding a better job, that's something I never had trouble with, except for that one period where I was just so broken. I didn't have the energy to put into it. I was just like half-assing like, hey, do you want to hire me? I (laughs) I exist. You should call me. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. But I remember back during the very beginning of my career when I was talking about everything crashed and my sister-in-law lost her job. She got laid off. She was like, oh man, like, I don't know what I'm going to do, blah, blah, blah. And then I remember I ended up being in a position where I was switching jobs a few months later. And she was like, well, you're going to be fine. Like you can convince anyone to hire you for anything, <laughs> even if you've never even done it. And I was like, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and it literally is like, I've done so many jobs because I've always been like, well, that looks interesting. I could do that. It looks fun. Now, sometimes like we talked about at the very beginning or some conversation, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. And I've definitely had those experiences where I got into the thing and I'm like, oh, yep. no, what, what was Same. I thinking? <laughs> but I've always been good at navigating the office things, finding the jobs, negotiating offers, negotiating pay raises, aside from that one where everything went wild. <laughs> <laughs> Where it wasn't, a, it was supposed to be a pay, pay raise negotiation and it turned into, let's hire you a boss. <laughs> it's an exception to everything for everyone. Yep. Right? <laughs> but always known what to do in all of those situations. That's why I was always able to go from job to job, whether I had experience or not, have someone be like, yes, I've been hired on the spot for so many things. It's ridiculous. And I tell people that and they're like, who gets hired on the spot? Like, <laughs> and I'm over here like, that's not a thing. <laughs> and when I really, really, really started thinking about all of my experiences and the bad ones and the red flags that I knew they were red flags. And I was like, but I just want to do the good work. <laughs> and I just want to pause for a moment right there. Like if you hit on this a little already, but if you're in a job and you think, man, this is like 90% great, but 10%, I just want to cry every day. Like, whoa, <laughs> guess what? You can't make that nope. work. You can't, you have to move on. No matter how much you love the work or your coworkers or whatever other thing is there, if there is something that is consistently making you feel less than or making you miserable or making you want to cry at your desk or cry in the car. Get yes. out. Get just out right now. Just listen to Sarah. <laughs> Don't try to be the exception. We've all tried. It's just no. Exactly. And in that, I also want to throw out there, most of us have been in the tricky financial situations at some point in our yes. life. We all get money stuff when we're really young and we all get money stuff when those tricky things happen. With almost every single client I have, we discover that it's actually so much more possible and so much healthier if you just quit. Like one of the things that we talk about a lot with my clients is if you are no longer exhausted, like how long can you actually go? Like, let's look at it. Let's do the math. How long can you actually go and be okay? Because if you're no longer exhausted, your job hunt is cut. The time for that hunt is cut significantly because you're not exhausted. You're showing up as your best self. You're not spending all of this time and energy working on this stuff. So you can focus on what you really want, how to get there and actually show up for your applications and your interviews as yourself, as your best self, not this version of you that's been beaten into the ground by a job that doesn't appreciate you. 100%. And you can like suss out the other red flags because you're not desperate to get away from where you are. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, like when you have the options, it's, it's not like, well, I have to do this. I have to do this right now. You can, you can ask the questions that get at company culture because it's really important. And I think even employers are starting to realize more and more how important that is. Not everybody, (laughs) but But more employers are starting to realize that. And some of the things that employers say that they think are making things sound good are also starting to get out there more and more so that you can start to understand that they're red flags. Like, you know, everyone knows at this point, if if an employer says, we're like a family, that you run like hell. Yes, run. (laughs) Run. (laughs) Well, I really want to keep talking to you because there's so much brilliance you can share. And I'm almost wondering if it would make sense to have you back for an episode on being multi-passionate because that is such a big topic. But for now, to wrap things up, tell people where they can find you, how they can learn from you and how they can work with you. Yeah. So uh, you can find me at, if you want to find all of the things, I'm just going to list yes. all of the things. If you want to find all of the things, you can find me at sarahhockett.com. Um, Sarah with an H. If you want to look into career stuff specifically, if that's 
website is sorryforyourboss.com. Um, I'm offering right now my 30 day career clarity challenge. If you go to that page, you might find an extra fun little nugget on there. <laughs> wink, wink. We'll link that in the show notes. I don't know that one off the top of my head, but that one actually gives you an exercise to do for 30 days to help you really, really understand what you do and do not want in your life and in your career. I'm a big fan, but I'm also biased. (laughs) (laughs) And you also have all of your incredible books and your coloring book. Oh yes. We'll link those as well. I have several journals. I have a journal planner hybrid, especially if you're feeling in a weird place right now, that one's super excellent for helping you stay on track and get to know yourself a little better. And if you're just feeling like you hate your job right now, I highly recommend my fuck work coloring book. It's very cathartic it's thing ever. <laughs> to, to color those words in when you're feeling like everything is trash <laughs> around you. Even when it's not like, I, I don't want to say everything is trash around you, but I know how it can feel yeah. that sometimes. And that's, that's a nice, fun little way to cope. <laughs> I love it. And I love and adore you. I'm so glad that our toxic experience led us to each other and that we get to be a part of each other's worlds. And I'm, I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful for the help that you give us with the podcast because you're incredible. And I love, I, doing just, it. I love that you're doing this work because it's so needed, especially right now. Like so many people are burned out and wanting to make changes with everything going on in the world. And so it's just, it's such important work. So thank you for being here and for sharing. Thank you for having me.